Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us on today's Sense of Feely Sparring Partners webinar on the future of spectrum policy. Our speakers today are former FCC Commissioner Mike O'Reilly of MP O'Reilly Consulting, Amit Nagpal, partner at Etha Consulting, and Monica Paolini, principal at Sense of Feely. I'm Kendra Chamberlain, and I will be moderating our webinar today. In Sparring Partners webinars, we watch our debaters discuss a topic live on video. We'd like to encourage our audience to participate in the conversation. Please share your questions and comments through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. All comments are visible to all participants, so please keep the conversation polite and respectful. Our speakers will do their best to address questions as they go along and as they become relevant to the topics being discussed. So please do not hold your questions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Monica. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, two friends of mine, uh, Amit, that I've been known for a very long time. We were used to work, uh, our desks were close to each other. And uh, Mike, I got to know more recently, but he's been really like the nicest guy nicest guy at the FCC I ever met. He's really ni nice and uh, uh, extremely knowledgeable about everything. So it's a pleasure to be here. And today what we're going to talk, it's uh, holidays are coming. So we're going to have a more of a future looking uh, topic. And we're going to talk about the future of spectrum regulation. And it, it's interesting because when you, if you look at it sort of from really a mile high, you know, it used to be that you just have a few bands allocated to mobile operators that will fight, get them. And then we got Wi-Fi on top of that. And, on, and clearly there were a lot of bands allocated to specific for specific users, like the fence and things like that. And that was kind of a simple, everybody got a piece of the action. And, and now everything is getting a little bit more complicated because you can share spectrum. Uh, we can use higher bands. If you remember at the beginning, you know, just thinking about using 2.5 gigahertz for cellular seemed to be like just scary stuff. It's like, you know, it's too high of a frequency. You can't really do anything. And now we are talking about millimeter wave and I uh, And also who is using the spectrum has changed. So it's not just the mobile operators or individual users or, you know, enterprise doing their own Wi-Fi network. Uh, it's uh, enterprise wanting to use cellular uh, bands, uh, hyperscalers, you know, there's, so there's much more, uh, met more users, more bands, more models. And so what does that mean? So what I'm gonna ask uh, is first to ask uh, Amit and Mike to introduce themselves and then we will open it up and, uh, you know, as usual, ask your questions. Oh, one thing that I wanted to mention, we were planning to talk about uh, uh, auction 110, the 3.45 gigahertz mid bet, but uh, we don't know yet who won it. So we kind of like, maybe we need to do it in January or some other time. Not yet, no, no, no time yet. But if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. So, uh, Mike, why don't you get started? Tell sure. Well, you are. I mean, we all know who, most people know who you are, but why don't you go ahead and say it then you? Well, look, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm Mike O'Reilly, formerly of the FCC for seven years. Prior to that, I spent 20 years on Capitol Hill working on the statutes that govern uh, telecommunications and technology policy. So, this is a, a very dear subject of interest. And I loved how you phrased uh, the, the conversation is this Christmas time and the Christmas carol kind of thing comes to my mind when you talk about the past and how you explained what we did in the past and where we are today and where we're going. So it's, it's a lovely, uh, a lovely uh, analogy for, for uh, the Christmas season. Yes, it is Christmas season. And what is it you're doing, Mike, now, if I may ask? So I have a, yeah, I'm doing a little consulting and, and providing, a, you know, some, doing some writing. I'm probably providing advice and some suggestions to to folks that are interested in my consulting uh, company, MP O'Reilly Consulting Inc. And you have a blog, which I highly blog. recommend. Uh, yes, I have a new blog, a TMT and Me. Um, I'm also a, a, a visiting fellow at the Hudson Institute um, and a senior fellow at the Media Institute. Yeah, you just have a long title. 
<laughs> Ahmed, how about you? Right, slightly shorter title. So I'm a partner at Ether Consulting and uh, we're a consulting company very much specialising in uh, advising the telecom sector on a whole wide range of strategic and regulatory issues. And typically, I would say uh, a lot of our work involves numbers. You know, the, the answer is a number or a series of numbers. So we're, we're very quantitative uh, in that sense. And in, in respect to myself, uh, I've been working in the area spectrum, uh, gosh, almost 30 years now. Um, I started my career with the UK regulator and then moved into consultancy, first on the engineering side, uh, and then more into business consultancy. And it's just scary to think, Monica, it was, it's, it's, it's 20 years, it's pretty much exactly 20 years that we, we worked together uh, uh, back in, I remember those days in, in uh, uh, the Bay Area and also in uh, our time on site in, uh, with a client in uh, Taipei. So think about 3G licenses at those points, the 2.1 gigahertz licenses. And it, it does make you feel old when you get to the end of a 20 year license, you know, and you're, you're looking at its renewal again. No, absolutely, and uh, yeah, and and I mean, we'll, we'll bring also the, the the sort of UK perspective, uh, which is which is interesting to you know we don't know just talk about US, and uh, yes, I mean, and you know, uh, Ahmed and I were working on the 3G auction, and uh, uh, at that point, if you remember, the weird thing, well, not weird, but the, the 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 thing that we were really struggling with is that what would people do with this? You know, if you remember, like you know, what's the we were thinking about the killer app and whatever, and um, I have to say that uh, my, you know, uh, my intuition was very different from what it actually turned out to be. Like, I didn't think that video would be such a big thing. Now, who wants to appear on video? But hey, I got proven wrong way big, big time. Well, here's the interesting thing. I think Bill Gates has a very famous saying of saying, you know, when you look at a new technology, you probably overestimate what it does in the short term and underestimate what it does in the long term. And I, probably that's true for what happened with 3G, you know, I think there was a hope that there'd be lots of video calling and great use of, of, of it all, you know, from day one. And as we know, it actually didn't really take off until 2007 when Apple launched the iPhone. Now, the other interesting thing is if you actually look back at some of the hype around 2000 and you look at some of the designs of handsets that, you know, Nokia had put out and Ericsson and the likes had put out, uh, you know, they had some pictures of advanced phones. What actually ended up is not miles away from that in actual fact. And probably if anything, we've probably, you know, if you look at what mobile has done, it's probably done more than we probably thought in 2000. I mean, who would have thought mobile, for example, if 3G is going to completely revolutionize the taxi industry? You know, I mean, you know, Uber has completely changed that whole model. I mean, nobody would have foreseen that in 2000. So I think there is an element of Bill Gates. It, it took longer to occur, but actually it's been far more reaching yeah. than probably any of us could have imagined at that time. Yeah, I didn't think that Uber was going anywhere <laughs> when I first heard about it. Another, like, you know, uh, as an analyst, you think you're always right, but you know, we, we just don't. So Mike, tell us about the Christmas Carol view and what, what's your view on that? Well, look, I, I really, I liked how you framed also the conversation on 3G, because I remember having these conversations with industry um, at the time and asking, you know, we were just, they were forming 4G, uh, the 4G standards when we were, you know, auctioning off some of the 3G licenses and they were working on them. And I, I actually questioned some of the industry said, is there a way to skip 3G and just get to 4G? Because I thought the video was the most, you know, the killer app. Um, and they looked at me like I had, you know, four heads. Um, they're like, why would anyone need that? Of course, you know, we're on, you know, focus on 3G. It's going to, you know, be here for, for quite a while. And it, it was, um, but it, but it, it is interesting to see how, how things have played out. I think the meets said that very well. But, you know, when I look at the things we've done well in the past and or the things we've done wrong in the past and how we've migrated, spectrum policy has changed tremendously, not only in the use of auctions, but also, you know, the, the allocations and how broad, the, the, certainly do, domestically in the United States, but also globally where we provide, you know, basically say, this is going to be a mobile purpose and, you know, have at it for whatever, you know, service that you may want to do. We've moved away from particular segments for specific services. And, and that's, that's been incredibly valuable um, for my mind. And then we get to today and you talked about the three, four, five auction and I, where I think that, you know, the, you know, where we are in the present. And I worry that there's not enough mid-band spectrum being made available, certainly domestically in the United States, that more bands are needed. I worked really hard to bring C-band online, worked really hard to make three, four, five online. Um, but if you look 
you know, to the future part, what are those next bands coming forward? What are the, what are the next mid bands um, in, in the United States? And I can't tell you what they are. Is it, is it seven? Is it eight? Is it 12 gigahertz? I don't know, but in any event, we're years away from having those bands available for that purpose. And so there's going to be this, you know, this, this lag between the operation of three, four, five. Yeah, certainly lower three, there's going to be something in lower three. We just don't know how much we're going to get out of it. And I'm sure we'll get into some of the sharing conversation um, and, and how that plays into lower three. So, so I'm, you know, I, I look back and say, wow, what was able to do, you know, we were able to do in the, in the past. I worry about where we are right now. And the future looks interesting as I also turn to things like 6G and terahertz, terahertz bands. So, so it's a really, you know, what does sharing mean at terahertz? So really a, a complicated conversation to be had in the next uh, many minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, Amit, why don't you tell us a little bit about the rest of the world? Uh, because it's, it's like, and, and, and I guess it, maybe we can even talk about like a little bit about like the FAA. So, you know, in the US, we have all this kind of discussion about the FAA altimeter, mm. but everybody's using that frequencies in the rest of the world. But anyway, but before we get there, maybe you can say, what does it look, you know, we heard about US, what about the rest of the world? I, UK I and... think, yeah, I don't think it's too dissimilar in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of focus on mid-band spectrum at the moment, as, exactly as Mike says. And I think the reason for that is it's kind of the optimal mix of uh, coverage and capacity, uh, if you like. You know, millimeter wave has, has not really sort of moved in the rest of the world. I mean, one of the big reasons is uh, the iPhone models that you have in the US um, support millimeter wave. Anything you buy outside the US doesn't doesn't have the millimeter wave support. So their operators are kind of it's the classic chicken and egg problem. You know, the reason they've not done that is because op, uh, you know operators haven't deployed it. Operators are not deploying it because it's not in the in the devices. So there's a little bit of an issue there. Um, and as well as the sort of mid band issue, I worry a little bit about the low band spectrum. And the reason I worry about the low band spectrum is there will always be areas of coverage which only the low low bands can reach. And at the moment, you know, a lot of governments are talking about they want ubiquitous 5G. But when they say ubiquitous 5G, the politicians are thinking the same 5G everywhere, not super fast 5G in the cities and this very slow, more, more like a sort of old traditional 4G type service, uh, you know, when you start to get into the areas which can't be covered by the mid frequency bands. And I worry that as soon as, 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 as 5G starts to take off and real 5G if you like, gets going with with all the millimeter wave, uh, milli, uh, sorry, mid band spectrum, the hundred megahertz carriers and the likes, we're suddenly going to have this very inferior service, and there's going to be huge pressure from the public onto politicians to have real five G. And how on earth are we going to do that with with, uh, with with you know there isn't enough low band spectrum, just the laws of physics. There is only so much spectrum under the under one gigahertz. So you expect you know that's not the solution. The only solution is to have a much more denser network so we can make more use of those, those uh, high frequencies and uh, or mid-band frequencies. And the problem there, of course, is that who's going to pay for that? I mean, you know, the data traffic volumes are going up, as we know, exponentially. The revenues at best are flat. I mean, in some countries, they're, they're, the ARPUs are still declining. So there's going to be, if you like, I think one, way, one, one, one term I've heard used is a sort of investment gap. You know, there's only so much the industry can afford to, towards ubiquitous 5G, and that will be essentially deploying three and a half gigahertz and the likes, the mid-band spectrum on the existing sites for as far as it'll cover. But all the stuff that's outside that, that's gonna have this slow 5G or 4G, it's it's gonna need some investment. And uh, the only way to plug that is probably realistically gonna be some sort of government investment. So that's that's kind of how I see the sort of the world looking at this. Yeah, so, but if you go with the, government i mean just so you know in like in uh metropolitan areas where it's dense you don't need government to no. read but so you're, you're talking about you need more in the sense of uh government intervention when you get into rural areas or yeah, low density. Rural. I mean, yeah. there are still there are always still bits of even urban areas where you know you just happen to be at the edge of the cell coverage you know there's things there's, mm -hmm. there's things in the way mm -hmm. so the only spectrum you've got you, you, you probably noticed this you know yeah. suddenly your phone is not as responsive as it as it would otherwise be can you plug all of those probably not uh but you know there will be some some element of that but i think the bigger issue is yeah as you move to less populated areas and things like highways and the likes yeah so so basically the idea is that 
we have a digital divide and the digital divide might become deeper if we don't do something and it cannot just expect operators to just throw money at it because it, it is it, the business case is difficult mm. so you need to have some other way other some other way to go or accept the digital divide basically right so i don't know mike what do you think about that well i, I think you're seeing you know both parts you're seeing you know a reflection that government is going to invest certainly domestically uh, the United States is investing, you know, substantial sums to expand out broadband throughout the nation. Do I ever think it's going to get to 100 percent? No. But are we going to get, you know, high 90s? Absolutely. Um, with, with the amount of money we're talking about investing. And I think a lot of those solutions are going to be wireless driven, um, fixed wireless or whether they be, you know, in, in some instances, they'll get to the millimeter wave uh, bands, you know. But but I think I, I think there's the two parts. One government investing. And secondly, you're going to see that, you know, which we've always seen in telecom network, the cross subsidization, right? The, the money made, um, you know, in, in industrial parts of, of urban centers uh, is going to help build out the network to, to cover more people, glo you know, nationwide and globally. Um, that, that's not uh, uncommon. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking that's, that's, that's a natural thing. Um, and and we'll continue to 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 move forward. But I th but the idea that we're going to have everybody, you know, it's going to have you know by the landmass, I think, is the really tough spot. When you talk about urban populations or having a, a high percentage of consumers covered on where they live or where they generally go, that's one thing. If you're talking about every square foot of of a nation or or the globe, that's a much different. Uh, and it gets to the heart of your point in terms of you know how dense can you build this network and and how do you have in towers in the middle, you know, or wireless antennas in the middle of fields for miles upon miles. And I think that's a heavy, heavy lift to expect people to invest in. Yeah. Indeed. I, th I think the problem is there might be a little bit of a political disconnect. I mean, for example, Europe is talking about ultimately every single road. And, you know, anyone who's been in Europe will know some of these roads are very small little lanes. You know, they're not big highways or anything like that. So small little country roads, you know, every, every road being covered by ubiquitous 5G to support things like but, the cars. But isn't it that that's that's going to need a but lot But your point of is, is well taken, right? That these small, tiny roads, right? Why aren't there, why isn't there a five, four lane highway going to that? Because there isn't the, the need for it, right? And so the idea that you're going to have fulsome 5G to every single um, location when you can't even build a road to certain places and you don't have the, the necessary in infrastructure elsewise, whether it be grocery stores or gas stations or all the other things that go with a you know, metropolitan, you know, environment. So I, I, th I think it's, it's not surprising that you're not, you, the, the idea that you're gonna have fulsome 5G in every square inch uh, of, the, of, of a nation or uh, globally is, is really tough to, to fathom. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think we need to be realistic because yeah, we wanna bridge a digital divide, but that doesn't mean that everybody's gonna need to have, or, well, everybody would like to have a gigabit connection to their home, but do we really need it? Or is it better to just say, well, you're not gonna get, that much, but it's going to be good enough, and we get it to everybody. So, the and and the risk is that you might just deploy five G where it's kind of a cheaper, a better deal, but then you kind of leave on aside people with areas where it's much more expensive to build that kind of coverage, but you can still do something. So I think we need to, you know, it's not necessarily five G that you need everywhere. I think to my to your point. No, that, that's that's very fair. Well, and, and in the United States, we're looking at subsidizing uh, the consumer experience, uh, you know, for those that can't afford it. So trying to, you know, both on the front end and the back end, I think is, is, is helpful. But, you know, I think that a 5G, when I look, if you can get 5G in many places, you're in, you know, what is what is sufficient broadband or what is sufficient speeds um, for what, you know, your needs are. People say, I'd love, a, you know, I want a gig. I have to have a gig. Um, but what do you really use? And, and that we see that in schools and libraries. What are they really using, and they're overpaying, you know, left and right uh, for those services, and that's that's pretty problematic for public policy, uh, you know. But I think that what where you can get to in terms of speeds and other things from five G is incredible, um, and, and it's really going to shrink the user experience, um, and the difference between the user experiences that depending on where you live. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's go and talk about different frequencies. So we, we're just sort of like, you know, we're going to millimeter away, so we have. The, the low band, the low and then all the way up and i'm actually i just i just got a, a new paper on millimeter wave indoors i'm a big believer it's not a lot of, a lot of people don't believe in it uh but i think that you know we, we need to have more indoor coverage and that's that one possibility over you know uh but what do you see because you know we're, we're just getting more and more comfortable with higher frequencies is that 
really game changing or is it just going to be so far out that it's not it's not really addressing an issue in in the near future or what's your view of you know the, the talk, so talking about you know beyond eban you know like 100 gigahertz what what's going on there is that feasible i think uh, go ahead mike no, no, please. Yeah. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say, I think it's just a gradual process, you know, in the way we're working up the frequency bands, you know, you, you talked about two and a half now, you know, before, and we were thinking, you know, what on earth is that going to do? Now we're looking at three and a half, you know, you're looking further up, uh, up the scale and millimeter wave like. So I think we're just, technology is improving gradually over time and we're creeping our way up. So it's, it's about creating the, the opportunities for companies to innovate. And I think, you know, the FCC is looking at doing that, the, the Ofcom in the UK is, looking at that, you know, to create sort of test and trial licenses so that companies can try and innovate and, and make more use of these frequencies. So I think it will gradually increase over time. And, you know, you see that with not just the mobile industry, but other industries, you know, things like uh, the satellite industry. You know, there's a lot of discussion that um, some of the higher frequency bands, KA and even KU before, could not be used in, for example, parts of Asia where they get a lot of rainfall. Now technology means they can start to be used. It's still not as good as the lower bands, but they are increasing being used. So I think it's a it's it's a gradual thing over time. Sorry. Yeah, I'd actually agree. It's not much in terms of sparring here because I I think it's <laughs> it's, it's over a time period. You know, the United States pushed hard for for millimeter wave auctions and and clearing of bands and and had a lot of different fights globally. Um, and I think those things will come online. Uh, you know, aggressively whether you know 24, 26, 28, 37, 30. 39. I think those bands are going to come online and be ingrained into um, existing networks. It's just going to be over more time period. Um, and then when you talk to the higher frequencies, above 100, um, I remember, you know, looking at research that's been done over 400 gigahertz. Um, so some really, you know, some, some cutting edge stuff. When I talk to people about 6G, that conversation does tend to, to talk about, you know, above, you know, above 100 and, and what is it going to look like and what does it mean for sharing bands and what you know how what is the propagation and what is the the usage case kind of thing so it's i i think it's all in it happening um and some of it's gradually some will be kind of fits and starts um but it's all inevitable in my mind yeah We're too much in violent agreement aren't we yeah <laughs> okay let's see let's see whether we, we can disagree on something here if you were to think you know what is that we're going to get the most uh, value in terms of uh in, in sort of like in the next five, five, 10 years? Is it gonna be by sharing spectrum, um, allocating more, well, I guess there is as much, uh, allocating more unlicensed, going up the the, the sort of uh, the frequency. So what is the best option we have moving forward? I mean, the, in terms of what, what is gonna be most beneficial or that we need more? I'm gonna be very boring and this may not be uh, helping with, with creating a spine, but I think you need all of them. I'm sorry to say, you know, I think, you know, we need we need a mix of, I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many different radio communications uses and so much mm -hmm. innovation mm -hmm. coming from different sectors. You know, there's a lot of innovation coming from 5G, as we've talked about Uber or 4G in the case of Uber mm -hmm. and the likes. There's a lot of innovation coming from the, uh, what, uh, the, the wireless LAN use. And, you know, for example, I think a lot of AR, VR applications are first going to be developed in the sort of Wi-Fi environment in the home. And then they may over time move over to 6G, for example. And really, you, you really need all those things to happen. You need all, all these organizations to have access to the spectrum that they need. And part of that is making new frequency bands at a higher range available. So it's a little bit boring. If, if I was asked to say, what are gonna be the two, I, I, I'd struggle to, to, to name one driver because I think absolutely mid band spectrum is where the, the mobile industry is, that's clear. That's the, that's the next five years. But, you know, millimetre wave is there, but it's really about mid-band in the, in the short term. But I think also for Wi-Fi, you know, the six gigahertz band and all the innovation that's going to come from that is also very, very important. Yeah, so when I look at, I'll disagree slightly and say, when okay. I look at spectrum heat policy here, um, you know, I think that, you know, we've, domestically anyway, we have allocated spectrum at six, G, six gigahertz for unlicensed. And so maybe there's there's definitely room for more unlicensed spectrum. Um, but add 5.9 to that pot um, and you've got, you know, different operators. And so I think you have a pretty fulsome uh, Wi-Fi or unlicensed portfolio. You'll probably add one more band to that. But what's really missing is more um, exclusive licensed spectrum going forward. How, what do we deal? How do we deal with, 
you know, the next, if the question was five to 10 years, what does that portfolio look like? I'm having a tough time figuring what the next three years looks like in terms of what those bands are. Um, and you look at WRC's IMT for, for 23 and the list is lame. And, you know, that, that's my word, a technical term, if you want. I mean, it's, it's really lacking and, and it's, a, it's a lack of um, aggressiveness on, on behalf of the world um, that, that needs to be addressed. And so I'm, I, I think that we're missing the, the boat here. Um, I think shared spectrum in my mind, um, yes, it, it means something at six gigahertz and, and, and you know, above 100, you know, it's a little different conversation, but shared to me just fits in where you can't do something else. And it's a great tool to have in the toolbox, but it is not the solution overall. I mean, CBRS in the United States has been very helpful, but it required an enormous amount of effort to get where we are today um, and, you know, beneficial, exciting. But it's a lot of work to get here and fighting with, you know, federal agencies and we can get into the FAA conversation. That is not a, an easy lift. Um, and, and I think lower three gigahertz is where we're probably going to have the same fight um, we're sharing. So the idea that it's sharing is going to be a solution to anything in, in my mind is, 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 is not accurate. Yeah, but when you think about it, you know, like the, the 3.45, it's basically shared. So. Uh, shared is more than CBRS on six gigahertz. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I mean, three dot four or five, I would say, is is sharing for the short term, right? Eventually, the military is going to have to clear out of there. They may not want to admit it at the current moment, but then they are uh, going to move out um, and make it as clean as possible. Yeah. Well, so I'm gonna, 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 gonna just. I mean, I, I'm gonna be a little bit disagreeing with um, with Mike. Clearly, you, we need uh, uh, license. Bands. But I think that right now, what, what I'm seeing the opportunity is to have bands that are regulated in a different way. And when I mean shared, and so I think shared is, is, a, is an important way to go, but we need to think beyond CBRS. Not, CBRS is a great thing. And Mike, you can tell us because you've been doing so much for it. Um, so it's, it's a great thing, but there is more, there is many more ways to share spectrum. And so, you know, the three, so, and basically to get, to reclaim spectrum that is underused, most, more spectrum is underused, but some is more underused than other. And we need to make sure. So the way I see the issue of shared spectrum is to try to get the use of spectrum more efficient to use it to use the spectrum more and sharing it away and then sometimes you might need to have the you know defense or other user incumbent users just use it in a different way so that they allow others to use it as well whether it's licensed or unlicensed i actually i'm a big proponent of unlicensed but now when you think about it with six gigahertz 60 gigahertz also unlicensed i think that we ha we're pretty doing i mean in the us and in, mo in many countries we're doing pretty well with unlicensed yeah i would agree with that i think that there is a, a port you know the portfolio for wi-fi or unlicensed services has been you know worked out I, I, your point's well taken look at you know sharing you know i was using a more you know the, 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 a model approach but you know i think introducing unlicensed into six gigahertz is sharing right i mean mm. we're, we're not we're not bumping out the microwave uh, licensees, you know, not, notwithstanding their, their, their crying sessions. Um, and, and so I think that, yeah, yeah, there's going to be more of that uh, going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And even to be honest, some, I was going to say some of the exclusive use bands, what calls exclusive, are still shared. I mean, for example, yeah. you know, things like the three and a half gigahertz band, there are exclusion zones around, you know, yeah. radio astronomy sites or whatever it happens to be. So, his sharing has always been the way in the world of spectrum. It's just, it's just. I think what we're doing is increasing the toolbox with, with, with new models to get more advanced and complicated forms of sharing. But I think everybody will agree. So, so it's just a little bit boring to say this, I suppose, in in the context of this conversation. But what you don't want to do is have an overly complex sharing model where it's not needed. We don't need CBRS everywhere. You know, we need CBRS because of the particular issue that it had to fix. And you know, the six gigahertz is an AFC solution. You know that's horses for courses, and you know that's that that, that it's it's really finding what we need, uh, just just to just to squeeze more out of the spectrum. The one thing I do disagree with a little bit, though, is that I keep hearing this spectrum is unused all the time. Now that's true. There's a lot of geographic locations it's unused, and there's lots of times it's unused. But in the middle of a you know in the middle of a city, in a particular time of day, the problem is most of those uses occur simultaneously, which is why spectrum is in such hot demand. So the fact that it's unused at three in the morning, you can't sort of transfer it over, you know, it's not, it's not like a battery, you can sort of 
fill up over time and then release when you need it kind of thing. So I think, of course, we can do more to make better use of spectrum. Of course, we can squeeze more in. But this idea, you know, that I remember, I can't even remember the company, but it was sort of Google and Microsoft in 2005, producing all these charts saying most of the spectrum is unused. Well, you know, that, that's just the way the world is, I'm afraid. You know, a, a lot of, you know, we, we live in cities, we live in dense particular areas, and we tend to do things at similar times of day, which is, which is why the spectrum demand also happens in those areas and those times of day. So I'm going to disagree here. And okay. you're absolutely right. So there is nothing we can do. People, we're not going to convince people to do things overnight just because there is spectrum, right? I mean, that's not going to happen. Uh, but, but the reason, is, especially as we go higher in frequency, you know, you can use it, if, for instance, indoor and outdoor with, you can use millimeter wave, for instance, you can use it indoor and outdoor without having an interference. The frequency we use, six gigahertz is a great example. So that you can use it indoors without uh, having any effect on outdoor uses. So in that sense, I think there is a huge opportunity for increasing spectrum use. Yeah. Uh, which, but then again, it doesn't go to the, I mean, you're absolutely right. In the rural area, there's just so much need of spectrum. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the point of un, unused is, you know, unused efficiently. You know, it's, it, it's, it's how, you know, I, you, we still have spectrum in the United States. You know, taxi cabs are still using spectrum. Oh, you know, and and, and uh, now standing in urban centers, the the market has changed significantly um, to using app based solutions, and and we have spectrum still allocated for industrial purposes when the modern networks are moving to five G private, uh, you know, wireless networks, and and so there's going to be some shortage of or a time period when that's going to have to migrate, and we're going to have to move away from a fit on inefficient systems, and and maybe I would you know agree that they're unused properly. Yeah. Uh, by the way, sort of a, um, a note, do ask your questions because we're not going to have a QA and a at the end. So go ahead. And uh, I see there is a question. We're going to oh, get to that, that later because we that's we're going to get there. So we're not ignoring the questions. Please ask. Actually, them actually, Monica, I was about to come in okay. with that question. Okay. Why don't, we, why don't you do that? And then we'll we'll continue. So the question we had is from Rajendra Singh saying, can you please focus how technology will change completely paradigms of spectrum management? And I was going to say that one thing, you know, I, I will see is we talked about more sharing and more efficient use of the spectrum. I think over time, we will see more dynamic use of the spectrum uh, and technology will be the key enabler of that. Now, I've got to be honest, I've been hearing about sort of things like cognitive radios and self-configuration, figuring devices and all that ever since I started 30 years ago. And it's always 10 years away. So how long it will take, I don't know. But Probably at some point we will be in a world where everything can be done dynamically with algorithms and the likes, uh, and there won't be a need for spectrum managers. Thankfully, I think it's it's going to be well after uh, I've retired, so I still have a career, uh, still still left. Uh, it's not ten years away, but it's not quite ten years away. Um, but yeah, I think I think that that will happen, and that will mean we, we we make more efficient use of the spectrum. But there's a there's a long way to go yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually agree that technology is really improving spectrum efficiency. I don't want to you know harp on CBRS, but the ESCs and the SASs, that those models are going to be replicated, the, maybe not to the fullsome extent. You're going to also you have some SASs in, in six gigahertz. Um, so you have some of that, you know, there's going to be replication. I think that those technologies really improve the, the capability of use of spectrum. And so that will continue. Um, some of the things, you know, software defined radios and continue to, to be talked about kind of yeah, lots of those things I think are are down the road. Um, uh, you know, on that part, I, I can't disagree with you on. Yeah, there is a, yeah. The, well, I guess, you know, if you think about MIMO or Beamforming was the same, you know, you'd be talking about, mm -hmm. and then eventually it does come and you use it, but you know that it's not going to be, you know, in the, necessarily in the short term. Uh, but, but we've made a lot of progress. And so, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about CBRS for the good and bad of it. And uh, so, Mike, you mentioned the SAS and ESC. So for those of you guys in the audience that are not incredibly familiar, do CBRS every day. So the SAS basically allocates, tells the users who can use uh, the band. Uh, and the ESC, it's it's a network that basically scans for who is using it for the incumbents because you need to protect the incumbents. So the ESC network basically makes sure that nobody's using the band, so everybody that is not an incumbent can use it. Now, Mike, is that accurate? Yeah, that's that's accurate, and I think that you know you're seeing that you know 
dynamic frequency um, capabilities mm -hmm. and, and they're going to be replicated elsewhere. But they, you know, CBRS is, you know, you say the pros and cons or the pluses and minuses. And I think it's, you know, that's why I say I use that tool model or that, that approach in, in certain circumstances because it's really, comp you know, it took a long time to get it operational. Um, it's really providing interesting use for, for industrialization. I'm really excited about that. But you know, they're the it, it works in bands that are highly compromised. Um, you know, where you can't, you know, you, you don't want to build an ESC and have SAS that's expensive. Um, someone's paying the price for that in one form or another. So you, you want to minimize that if possible. Um, and so I think it fits in certain circumstances. I, I see, you know, possibility in, in lower three replicating it, maybe in the in one of the millimeter wave bands, but it, it's not something you can do else, you know, wise. And so it's a it's a, it's a wonderful little thing to have in your toolbox, um, you know, but you're not going to pull it out like a hammer every time. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, we need to be. But so what is that, you know, and, and again, you've been doing so much work on it. And I know that it was like, it, it, it was actually, I, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm surprised that it actually worked out, not, not from a technical point of view, but from just to get everybody to buy in. I mean, that to me, that was like a, a remarkable. Okay. Oh, okay. A theory. I mean, one, one thing um, was, I mean, the, I think the whole focus on CBRS was just because of the, the, the order of the spectrum, that the spectrum became available. And full credit to Mike on this one, I think, you know, the discussions on C-band happened phenomenally fast. You know, once it was identified as a possible option, the time taken from it being identified to come into actual use, well, usage is a hard word given the altimeter issue, but yeah. parking the altimeter issue into being auctioned and hopefully fully utilized soon, um, it's phenomenally fast. I mean, you know, it's previously taken 10 to 15 years between a band being discussed and coming into use. So I think what ha happened with CBRS is CBRS has been conceived for, you know, it's been discussed for many years and it was seen as the only possible mid-band spectrum, you know, and same as we're looking to say what next after, after all this. At the time, it was the only possible thing. So this thing, you know, it's not ideal, you know, the, the power restrictions on it and, and, and so on, but it's better than, you know, at the time it, it would have been better than nothing and it would have had a high value because of that. Then C-band came along and that really very much represented what the mobile operators, if you like, really wanted. Now, if the auctions had been the other way around, I do wonder if we would have had a very different outcome because it was almost like Verizon going in, you know, to C-band, so the, the CBRS auction saying, well, we don't know what's going to happen in the C-band and it could be delayed. And then let's, let's at least get some that you know get, get some spectrum now to solve our immediate problems just in case c-band takes on which might might actually prove to be uh, uh, very insightful if the altimeter thing drags on and on um but if they'd happened the other way around i don't think cbrs would have had as much competition and raised as much to be perfectly honest i don't know mike whether you agree with that at all yeah i mean in some regards yes I, companies are always going to want to buy spectrum at like at an auction um, to, you know, for future purposes. And I don't, I don't think that changed the timing. Yeah, I agree with you. Part of the reason to, to Monica's, you know, I appreciate her compliment to get everybody on board. Part of it was, you know, making sure that, that there wasn't any, uh, you know, there was an opportunity for everyone to use it. It wasn't exclusively for certain segment of the market. And, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to broaden the use of what, what Spectrum could be used for. And here we were trying to limit, you know, the, the previous mm. commission that I came to was trying to limit who could, who could, uh, who could bid. And I thought that was wrong, and it, it made antagonistic, you know, amongst a number of of, the, of bigger providers. And and they're gonna they bought licenses, they're gonna use it for certain purposes, and that's that's a wonderful uh, experience. That's why you're gonna get the very diverse um, portfolio of, of options in the band. But yeah, C band was always, you know, I I, th I think to me it took me forever. Um, in, in spectrum time, it took a short window because CBRS really came from the, you know, you could say it came from the national broadband plan in, in 2000 and we're, you know, in, in an auction in, in, in 18, you know, that, that's, 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 you know, a long time. C-band to me though, took five years, which was like a, you know, a lifetime of certainly my FCC career. Um, and, and now we're going to fight, uh, you know, we're having that fight with the, with the FAA, which is actually just tremendously problematic. Um, and it gets to the spectrum management issue uh, domestically and globally uh, because they, you know why aren't there more more bands on work 23 because incumbents and, and federal agency you know, governments um, are holding on to them in protectionist manners and that's what you're having with the FAA in the United States um, you know coming in after the fact coming in after um, you know they certainly they raised some concerns early on half-baked ideas based on very little data 
um, and the government had already said, you know, NTIA had pretty but you know, signed off on this um, to get to a great point. We're ready to turn on the switch on 5G. Consumers are going to see it in, in, in more more networks, and they 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 pull a red flag, and that that to me is just awful um, experience. And there's no penalty for them to do so. There's no reprehend, you know, there's no mechanism to to you know they they want to be seen right now, given their past fit, recent failures. Uh, as somebody who, you know, as an entity that is only about safety, whereas where they've been for, you know, how many years on, on safety issues for, for the air, airline industry. So I, I find this, you know, incredibly problematic, something they need to push through um, and, and move past, in my opinion. And hopefully the networks um, and the C-band winners will uh, start the networks in, in January and, and we'll, we'll have those flights as they're working through you know, in their in their mitigation techniques and the studies that will go forward, and we can come to a conclusion and not have to sit in per, you know perpetuity or, or or purgatory, I guess, um, waiting for some you know the FAA to finally be happy. Absolutely. When you oh, sorry, mommy, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think Mike raised a really good general issue of the topic of you know how do you get other government users to release spectrum? I mean, this is this has been the sort of an this has been one again, going all the way back to my career and probably, you know, probably earlier. And, you know, a whole load of techniques have been tried. I mean, to be to be fair to, you know, perhaps some of those are partially worked. So, you know, one, one, one uh, thing with, you know, the UK has been doing is starting to charge things like the defence authorities, you know, for use of spectrum. And that has led to some spectrum being released, you know, some of the 2.3 gigahertz band has been made available. And possibly the threat of that, or at least perhaps, perhaps even paying for it, had partially helped uh, the UK get to the stage of actually clearing the incumbent use from the three, the, the incumbent military use from the three and a half gigahertz band in the way that it hasn't happened yet, at least in, in the US. So I think you can, you know, there are techniques sort of, you know, using pricing that can help at the margins, but even then, you really need something from a higher level or to sort of bang government, different parts of government together and say, look, this part of government, uh, you know, can, can create a new use for the spectrum and he's going to generate a huge load of value for the economy in doing so. Now, this part of government is going to have a bit of a pain there because they have to do something different, you know, move to a new frequency band or you put in new spectrally efficient technology, whatever it happens to be, and there's a cost. But guess what? This gain over here is so much, you know, it's an orders of magnitude bigger than this cost. So let's, let's be sensible. Let's think of this as one organisation and do that. But you know, it's easy to say, but it seems to be very difficult to make it actually happen in practice. And, and I guess it's not the same in every country uh, because different countries have a different uh, view. And, you know, I think that to both of you, you know, the, the, the issue, so the FAA, that's something that has been debated now for a long time, you know, so it's not nothing new. Mm. It just came up because they can, basically. And, and so the question is that how to avoid it next time? And as you say, I mean, you know, that, that's a balance. We need to, we need to find. And so, do we have in, in the U.S. or in other countries? It seems like in the U.K. is a little bit better, but in the U.S., what, what do we have to? I mean, is there a better way to deal with this kind of issues? Because it's going to come up. It's, it's going to be the next, uh, the next time around. There's going to be somebody else complaining, and we had it in the past many, many times. So we we've had it domestically at least five times in, in my in the last many years, and this is. You know, this, this this adds to the list of an agency and look at it, you know, I, I get the efficiency argument and the balances that he talks about because you, you know, that's to me, that's what 3.45 auction is, right? It is DOD setting how much money they need and industry say, you know, there's a question whether the auction would close, right? And it, it far, ex, you know, it exceeded that, that number that was needed and a very inflated number that was, you know, that should have been scrutinized by DOD, but but we were willing to pay it. I mean, and I think the next time we're going to have to be more you know, more more careful about the 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 price for a federal agency. And so, to me, it's point. I, look, at, I I'm sorry, um, and I've been on this point. I've testified to this point. You know, it takes more sticks than 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 sugar here, or or, or carrots. Um, I I just don't think the federal agencies have any incentive. And I tried to copy, you know, what UK did, um, as others had in the United States, advocated for a, for a budgetary impact on spectrum. Uh, for federal agencies, and it, it just doesn't, you know, it, the, the, whether it be DOD or elsewise, use their leverage politically to kill off those things. And and we there's because there's no cost, um, federal agencies have no motivation. In fact, they get benefits globally if they can show that they were pushing back on the you know big bad wireless industry. Um, they certainly get benefits. And we look back at what happened at Warp 19 and the NOAA fights over over 
24, 26, 28 kind of thing. So it, that has to change. And that means leadership. Um, and, and, you know, you can call your, you, you can be designated as a leader, you can be called a leader, but actually leadership is actually deciding things that are difficult and moving forward. And the FAA is a great example. The, the problem we're having with the FAA right now, um, yes, it's been known about the issues been raised before in a half-hearted, half-baked, so, you know, mechanism. Um, but nobody in the, in the government in this administration, after we've told how terrible the last administration was, nobody in this administration has been willing to stand up and say, I'm sorry, FAA, this is not right. We've already done the work here. The engineers disagree with you. Well, you know, and what industry is proposing is sufficient for not only now, but going forward and likely to be um, unnecessary for the mitigation. You know, the power around airports and, and helipads are probably completely unnecessary. Uh, going forward. So, but no one's been willing to do that. And that to me is, is, is a dearth of leadership. Yeah, absolutely. There is something in the chat and we don't usually take you and from the chat, but I'm going to ask you this because I think it's relevant to the, what we're talking about now, uh, which is, uh, uh, are, are we just trying to basically, are, are we advocating to remove access to spectrum to public entities, which need it to just give it to somebody who's going to make money out of it, like mobile operators. And I think that this is not really the issue. No. The issue, because they can still use the spectrum, they just need to, like in the FAA case, it's not like they cannot use altimeters, they can use them. Uh, they just need to be more realistic and more cooperative in letting other people use it. Nobody is asking them not to use it. Absolutely. I think it's both. I, mean, I would say it's right? both. So, okay. it's both. It's definitely in those instances where, you know, like Dell Timbers, no one asking them to get out of 4.2 to 4.4. It's where they think that, you know, they can bleed down, you know, how far they want to, you know, bleed down. Um, the, the question, you know, we are asking those that have huge portfolios such as DOD, you're going to need to shrink your portfolio. In the, you know, I'm sorry, that is, has happened over many, you know, the last my 30 years in working on this. We're going to need to shrink your portfolio. That doesn't have to come at a cost of your overall mission. We can still do both, um, but it's going to be shrinking your, your portfolio. And in other instances, you don't get you know extraterritorial rights um, for for you know what you might have had uh, sitting next to uh, the, the you know the C band providers long ago. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was I was going to say. I mean, for example, take the UK and the three and a half gigahertz band. You know, the the the, the, the UK military has cleared the band, managed to clear itself from the band, so it's available for commercial use. But trust me, UK battleships are still sailing. You know, they're still going. They found another technological solution for that and so nobody's talking about taking away the public good we're just talking about perhaps adding a, a little you know having incurring some cost to move to a new technology or move to a new frequency band in order to free up spectrum for another use and yes okay that other use may create private value but that private value often is taxed so a lot of that comes back into the public good so in the form of additional taxpayer revenues which more than compensates for any costs in the other part of government. I think that's the key point. Yeah, and oftentimes, you know, you just get paid. I mean, so the, the public entities that use the spectrum get some compensation to move to whatever other band or whatever. Mm. So they're still able to do whatever they need to do. In fact, there is an advantage to them because oftentimes they can get updated uh, or a better solution. Or like for things like FirstNet, I mean, they can basically use the public networks for their own services. So there is actually an advantage to them to have better connectivity benefits everybody. Hmm. So, um, you know. Too much uh, okay. violent agreement here. <laughs> okay, we are in agreement, but uh, okay. So uh, let's see whether we can disagree on something. So uh, there is a question from the audience from uh, uh, Scott that talks about uh, uh, WRC 23 proposed, uh, a new 7, 1.25, 7, 8 uh, gigahertz to provide uh, a more usable spectrum. What hurdles uh, uh, to getting the spectrum approved and deployed? I cannot answer that question, but that raises another issue. And maybe you can uh, address it, but the more general issue here is uh, uh, what do we do in terms of harmonization, uh, in terms of international cooperation? Because, you know, Spectrum is so important that you just have, so for instance, six, six, six gigahertz, if it's only US and nobody else, the value is much reduced. There is, the value of six gigahertz is that is, a, is going to be available worldwide. And so how does that work in terms of, you know, the international cooperation? And, you know, if you want to address that question, um, go ahead. So what do you think? Well, I'll take it first and then, then meet yeah. you. 
Look, mm -hmm. I, two parts. One is, I think we touched upon this. Uh, DOD has got a, in the United States has a heavy role in seven and seven gigahertz. And so that's going to, you know, they got microwave uh, licenses there that are going to have to be addressed just like they did at the bottom of six or to the top of six. So, so yeah, you've got to figure that out. People talked about taking some of the microwave from six and putting it up with DOD in the seven. And, and that, that, that's, that's, that's all doable. It's just, you know, getting cooperation from DOD um, and to make that happen. But to your larger point, harmonization, incredibly valuable, incredibly needed, um, really dynamically, you know, anchor, you know, in terms of the, 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 uh, the, the overall benefits, huge. But when I look at WRC, I think there's two, you know, the two problems. One has been not aggressive enough in terms of making bands available. And then two, it's the, the structure or, you know, if we were to take the engineers from WRC and they could solve a lot of these issues. Instead, we have a mini U, you know, from the UN is a, it's a mini UN operational structure where the geopolitical issues are interfering with the agenda and the outcomes. Um, no one wants the United States to get ahead in 5G or you've got different, you know, countries that are not spectrum uh, in, in engaged, but they're playing a heavy role in WRC, making it less functional. So I really worry that, that that's not being addressed going forward. I, I think I agree with you in terms of sort of some of the issues with WRC. What I would say is you're very lucky in the States in that at least you have sufficient mass to, okay, you don't get the global economies of scale, but you can get the regional economies of scale and people will follow. So we all know the WRC and the 28 gigahertz saga, the US could go ahead and do it anyway and other countries follow. You know, if you're poor little, I don't know, Luxembourg or something, you know, you, you, that's, you've got no chance. You've got absolutely no chance. You're completely reliant on uh, reaching regional agreements at minimum uh, to, to, to have any chance of uh, do, doing something. So, yeah, you, you have it. I agree with you. It's a problem, but at least you have the luxury of scale in itself. You know, if AT and T wants to do something, trust me, Ericsson and Nokia will build it. You know, that's yeah, not and I for a, your point, look, and I've suggested that if you took eight countries that are really dominant in spectrum policy and, you know, they could make the rest of the WRC kind of in, irrelevant. If you, you know, if you created a G, G8 of spectrum policy, you, you could, you know, it, it could be its own network, you know, own system. And, and, and we saw this, you know, in, in, in 19, when, when France was such a pain in the butt um, on a number of different things and, 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 and their unwillingness to, to uh, you know, to move forward when the rest of their own you know, cooperative uh, region was willing to move forward. It's just, it, it doesn't work as it should be if the goal was harmonization moving forward. But, but isn't there a risk also <clears throat> with the US that we sort of are, or, and, 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 and I would say, I would argue that China has the same situation that you're big enough that you can just go whichever way you want, you have a market. So you don't need uh, any international cooperation. So it's like, a, screw it, we'll just go ahead and do it. And which is not good, especially if you have a bipolar type of uh, situation where China might go one way, we're going the other way. Is that good? And so is it also a way to basically um, reduce the urgency of our, from the US point of view, our involvement in the international scene? Because like, we don't care. We're just going to do whatever we want. Yeah, but I was making the point that not that the US would go alone, but that there are like-minded oh, yeah. you know like-minded countries in the globe that are willing to to move forward and we, we we shouldn't be stopped by and and i'm not to pick on luxembourg from a meets point but if that if they were the you know the the standout in the in the delegation and blocking um activity or you know it, and we, we know the bigger geopolitical issues you know happening in the world today from 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 nations you know china russia uh, iran all have bigger issues um with the united states and with the world in, in total um, so, so I, I would never suggest the U.S. go alone, but I think there is, you know, there has to be the, the realization that it can with partnerships of, of spectrum, you know, engaged countries. I mean, tying this back a little bit full circle to where we start in terms of the different frequency ranges. The good thing, of course, is that as we work up the frequency ranges, we, we don't need to worry as much about interference with our neighbors. So, you know, for example, Iran's use of analog television and, you know, keeping going on with that is just sterilizing the whole region at the moment, you know, from using the UHF band for 4G and the likes. Now, at least that becomes less of an issue as we walk up the frequency range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Mike, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that you were saying that we should go along, I mean, in, in the US. I'm just saying, are we sufficiently engaged? Are, are we 
pushing uh, enough because you know even for for a big country like the US it's actually good for instance for six, six gigahertz it's good if everybody adopts it even though there is enough market in the US it's there's still a benefit to us and it's yeah. also, I'm worried like you know for things like if we move to 5, 6G we do we do want to have as much harmonization as possible we don't want to have China going on a tangent because that's not good for us either it, regardless of all the other political so we want to engage even though we can go along I completely uh, agree that we want all of that and I do think there's a great number of things that this administration and, and this FCC can do to improve the situation one is being more engaged um, I spent a lot of time working you know internationally to try and you know improve the situation with countries both you know our partners here in North America and elsewise so I think you can do that and build these cooperative al alignments and you need the cooperation and, and collaborative approach as you go to 6G. I think now is the time to be talking about, you know, investing as, 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 as a globe and as, um, as countries as a whole, not as, you know, just as a domestic benefit to 6G. And I think the academia, government, industry can all work together and have a, a proper price as we move to 6G and then to talk about 6G standards setting are really vital that that process work in a very technical manner measure and we remove some of the geopolitical um, overhang that's been part of uh, things like 3GPP. Um, so I think there is value in all of that and can be done. The US has can improve from the last go around and the last couple go arounds um, to, to make that more uh, collaborative. You know what though, the, the one thing I, I sort of go slightly the other way is sometimes it's nice to have a bit of competitive tension so I remember one of the things that made, I think we'd probably all agree 4G was a very successful technology standard, certainly compared to the early days of 3G and perhaps arguably the early days of 5G as well. And probably one of the reasons for that was because of the competition with WiMAX. You know, we had these two standards and they were really pushing each other and that forced the cheap 3GPP community to accelerate up its game, whatever you want to call it. And now with 5G actually, the race, are, interestingly, has not been between standards, but it's been between different parts of the world. You know, who's going to be the first to launch 5G? Is it Korea? Is it the US? You know, uh, is it China? And so on. And maybe sometimes a bit of, I'll call it healthy competition, is not a bad thing. Yeah, actually, the way I look at it with, with WMAX is that WMAX lost the battle but won the war. Because if you remember at that time, that's actually what got 4G going because people are like, we don't really need it. And then when they saw WiMAX, like, oh, we have to do something about it. And I think that, you know, that's the same argument that I have for Wi-Fi and 5G is like, why do you need Wi-Fi if you have 5G? Well, we actually do want to have two fundamentally different technologies because they're going to challenge each other in, in a good way. So we don't want to go on a, on a 6G path that everything in the world, anything is 6G. I don't think it's a healthy way to go. Mm. You know, yeah, so your point is, you're right. I think the competition in 5G between you know Wi-Fi and and and, and 5G is, is going to happen. But I also think there's great collaboration between those two technologies. I think the yeah. the universes of them being so divergent is ending. Um, they're going to be much more. They're going to more look. They're going to look a lot like each other going forward. Yeah um you know and that, that's a good thing i think yeah yeah absolutely now we have a few minutes uh maybe you can ask you guys what do you think about the new fcc it looks like we actually have <laughs> full 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 number of uh, uh of people there so uh how do you think that that's going to change in terms of spectrum policy or other things is is that what yeah i mean i might only say uh, okay. we have a i was trying to debate like do we have a chair or a chairwoman i think she selected the chairwoman title, so so I uh, congratulate her. And I, I and you're, but in terms of having a full complement of commissioners, I don't know that that's true. Um, I don't know where the, the last nominee goes in that process. It looks like that's that's running into a buzzsaw of the, the U.S. Senate. So I'm not convinced right now that that nomination can move. And we'll just have to see if that's right. Um, and and you, I'm already, you know, you see a lot of people talking about, well, if it's not going to be her, who else is it? Who? And that's usually a danger sign. Um, for a nominee, in, in my opinion, I'm spending a lot of time in the political universe. So I think, but having a, at least four commissioners and, and a new commission moving forward, I think that's, and having a, a chairwoman um, to, that is knowledgeable about these issues, even if I disagree or they're on policy, is helpful um, and, and will be, you know, indicative of, of where we go and in, in, in certainly influential uh, in the next couple of years. 
Yeah, I stand corrected. That's right. The the, the fifth is not is not is not there yet. There, but at least we have a new meaning because it just took so incredibly long. It was very frustrating to look yeah. at. Yeah, that's I mean, do things like that happen in the UK? Well, little by little, you don't get the political side of all of this. Um, <laughs> well, actually, that's not true. Thinking about it, because uh, there was a, a lot of uh, discussion over who should be uh, leading Ofcom, um, particularly because it not so much because of the telecom side, but because it also broadcast the broadcast industry, in particular the BBC here. And uh, I don't know if anybody will know the UK. There's a little bit of concern about is the BBC too 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 left wing and, and the likes. And to be honest, this is one of those things that goes in cycles. It's been it's been there for many years. You know, it's it, it, this this all debate comes up and up again. So because we've got uh, a, a party uh, sort of centre right party running the running the country uh, at the moment, you know, obviously there's a little bit of concern that said that that government will put in somebody more centre right leaning in to, in, into that spot. So there's a whole lot of debate there about uh, about about that. But generally, with that exception, usually it isn't so politi politicised um, because they aren't really political appointments as such. You know, I mean, you, yeah. you know, the new government doesn't come in and change the the makeup of Ofcom, uh, as it were. Yeah, that that's kind of yeah. When you, when you think about I mean, in the US, we take it for granted, but when you think about it, is that, does it really need to go that be that way when it's you know? Um, but anyway, we are at the end of the hour. We could be talking for a few more hours here, but I think we need to keep going with our lives. So thank you, Ahmed and Mike. Thanks a lot for participating. It's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. And we'll give it back to Kendra. Over to you. Hey, thanks, Monica. Thank you to our speakers today for that great conversation. And thanks to the audience for your comments and questions. A recorded version of today's webinar will be available at the sensefili.com website in the coming days where you can access it. We have a couple sparring partners coming up in the new year. The next one will be January 27th. And a registration for that will be available on the sensefili.com website. And then we have a few more in the works uh, on 6G, net neutrality, and women and men in wireless. And registrations for those will also be available in the coming weeks on sensefili.com. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at future events.